Even though UFOs are seen everywhere, over the desert, over the ocean, over cities, there's no way to predict when and where they'll show up. Well, no way except one. Build or detonate a nuclear weapon. Since the dawn of the atomic age, UFOs have been seen and photographed during nuclear weapons tests and near nuclear weapons facilities. The Ark of the Covenant is one of the most mysterious artifacts in human history. The Ark, a sacred chest made of wood and covered in gold, has been missing since 587 BC. Its last known location was Jerusalem, somewhere under the Temple Mount. So what does that have to do with UFOs? Well, in 2011, a UFO was hovering over the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. It emitted a flash of light, then shot straight up and disappeared into the night sky. Whoa. This could be just a coincidence, but it could be that the craft was looking for the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant is an object of extreme religious importance to over 2 billion people. So why would a UFO be looking for it? Well, because it's the most dangerous weapon of mass destruction ever created. The Ark of the Covenant. The story has captivated us for over 2,000 years. But what is the Ark really? A container for holy relics? Or as Indiana Jones said, a radio for talking to God? Or is it God's ultimate doomsday machine? A super weapon for the righteous? It's said to possess tremendous power, including the ability to unleash plagues and natural disasters. As the legend goes, an army that carries the Ark before it is invincible. Or was it something more mundane? The story of the Ark of the Covenant begins in the book of Exodus and is mentioned over 200 times in the Bible. It was carried by the Israelites as they traveled through the desert on their journey to the Promised Land. The Ark would fly into the sky miles ahead of the Israelites and show them the way. It would protect them from any dangers in their path. It parted rivers, created walls of fire, caused the mighty city walls of Jericho to crumble, and reduced mountains to dust. Uh, God sounds like one hell of a co-pilot. Well, the Israelites thought so. According to the Bible, God summoned Moses to the top of Mount Sinai. There, Moses was given two stone tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments. These tablets were to be stored in the Ark of the Covenant. God gave Moses very specific instructions on how to build it. Make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Then put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law, which I will give you. Yeah, cubit. I can't even convert to metric. Uh, don't expect me to convert to Bible. It was a little smaller than three foot by five foot. Hey, uh, did God give Moses one of those little wrenches like you get from Ikea? I doubt it. Yeah, that's too bad. Those are really helpful. They are, hey, but... did I tell you about the time I got thrown out of Ikea? No, what did you do? Uh, I asked the girl working there, hey, how much for a one-night stand? <laughs> On top of the ark were cherubim. Sometimes you'll see these depicted as angels, sometimes as winged sphinxes. The face of a man, the body of a lion, and the wings of an eagle. Make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. You a gold box filled with stone sounds pretty heavy. Well, it probably weighed about 500 pounds, maybe more. And God gave instructions on how it should be transported. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. Hey, look, I don't want to be a jerk, but uh, it might have been easy to put the thing on wheels. Well, maybe, but God wanted it to be carried by four priests of the Levite tribe. Boy, those priests must have been jacked, huh? Can you imagine the calves on these guys? I'd rather not. Yeah, and the Levite priests, who were appointed to carry the ark of the Lord, were not weak of body nor feeble of limb, for they had heeded the words of the Lord, Thou shalt not skip leg day. The ark was extremely dangerous. It had to be kept far away from where the Israelites camped, 2,000 cubits. Which is? Half a mile. Anyone who touched it would be killed instantly if they were lucky. If they weren't lucky, they would die in agony. But when we analyze the way the ark is described in the Bible, the materials used in its construction, the way it looked, the way it sounded, the way it killed people, it doesn't sound paranormal or supernatural. Actually, the Ark of the Covenant sounds like technology. There are a few theories that suggest the Ark of the Covenant 
may have been a technological device. One theory says the arc was an electrical capacitor. You build a capacitor by placing two conductive plates parallel to each other, with non-conductive material called a dielectric in between. The arc was built this way. The box was covered with gold on the inside and gold on the outside. Gold is a good conductor of electricity. The acacia wood in between the gold would serve as the dielectric. It's possible the arc could store and discharge electricity. According to this theory, the arc may have been used to generate lightning or electric shocks, which would have been seen as a manifestation of the power of God. In fact, there's a story in the Bible about a man named Uzzah, one of the priests carrying the ark. During the journey, the ark looked like it might fall. Uzzah reached out to steady it. When he touched the ark, he was instantly killed in a way that sounds like he was electrocuted. Another theory suggests that the ark was a machine that could communicate with God. And there I will meet with thee, and I will speak with thee from above the ark cover, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony. The cherubim on the lid of the ark may have functioned as antennas by providing a large surface area for the conversion of electrical energy into radio waves. The gold coating would allow those waves to be transmitted more efficiently. And there's a theory that the ark used nuclear power, that it contained radioactive materials such as uranium, which is found in the area. When uranium undergoes nuclear fission, it releases a massive amount of energy in the form of heat, light, and radiation. This energy can then be harnessed and used to power various devices or weapons. When the walls of Jericho came down, it was said to have been caused by the sound of the trumpets and the presence of the Ark. According to this theory, the Ark may have contained a radioactive substance that was triggered by sound waves that brought the walls down. Also, the priests who carried the Ark had to wear a metallic breastplate and a metal apron, not unlike the lead blanket used when you get an x-ray. And they wore metal clothes? Hey, yeah, I'm telling you, these guys were jacked. Also, whenever a priest approached the Ark, he had to have a rope tied around his leg. Around his jack leg. This was in case the priest died. His body could then be dragged away from the Ark. There's even more evidence that the Ark was radioactive. In the book of 1 Samuel, the Philistines and Israelites were engaged in a fierce battle. The Israelites brought out the Ark of the Covenant, believing it would bring them divine protection and victory in the battle. But God didn't command this, so the Ark didn't work. The Philistines won the battle and took the Ark to their own city, Ashdod. As soon as the Ark arrived, people's skin became infected with painful tumors. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great discomfiture. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and emeralds broke out upon them. Uh, break out of emeralds, huh? Oh, they make a cream for that. Emeralds. Emeralds are tumors that sound a lot like radiation burns. Then illness swept through the city. That sounds like radiation sickness. The Philistines believed that the Ark was cursed and moved it to another city, Goth. But the tumors and sickness continued. Then they moved it to Ekron. The tumors continued. Finally, the Philistines sent the Ark back to the Israelites, along with gold and incense. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines, and they said, Send away the Ark of the God of Israel, and let it go back to its own place. When the Ark was traveling, it was set up in a portable sanctuary called a tabernacle. This was an elaborate tent made of woven fabrics and gold. The Ark was always shrouded. It was too dangerous to be gazed upon. When the Ark was returned from the Philistines, some men got curious and looked at the Ark when they weren't supposed to. Seventy of them were struck down by the Lord. Yeah, if Indy says don't look, uh, you really shouldn't look. Good advice. For a time, the Israelites experienced a period of peace and stability. But the Ark remained a powerful symbol of the Israelites' covenant with God and their faith. The Ark was eventually moved to Jerusalem, where a temple was built. The Ark was then placed in the Holy of Holies, the innermost chamber of the temple. The Ark remained there for over 300 years, and it played a central role in Israelite religious life. And then suddenly, it's gone. In 587 BC, after a 30-month siege, the city of Jerusalem fell to the Babylonian army. The Babylonians then looted the temple's treasures and burned the building to the ground. The Babylonians kept meticulous records of everything they took from Jerusalem. And even though the Ark of the Covenant was stored in the temple, it wasn't on the list. And that's where the Ark disappears from history. So if the Babylonians didn't take it, who did? And where is it today? Some people think the answer lies on the infamous Copper Scroll. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, most were made of papyrus and contained religious stories not found in the Bible. But one of the scrolls was very different. It was made of copper. 
According to Ark Hunter Jim Barfield, the Copper Scroll does not contain the Word of God. The Copper Scroll is not a Bible story. On that copper, they have hammered instructions to find treasures from the Temple of Solomon, which I believe includes the Ark of the Covenant. Barfield believes that while the Babylonians were attacking, the treasures of the Temple of Solomon were quietly taken out of the city. Among those treasures was the Ark of the Covenant. The book of 2 Maccabees says that the prophet Jeremiah did exactly this. Underneath the Temple Mount is a vast network of tunnels. But even though miles of tunnels have been explored, none were ever found that would serve as an escape route from the Temple. But in 2007, that would change. A new tunnel was found that runs from the Temple Mount to the Kidron Valley, well outside the city. From Kidron, the Ark could have been taken to a town called Qumran. This also happens to be the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. The Copper Scroll lists 64 places in and around Qumran where treasures might have been hidden. One place is described as steps, east, 40 cubits long. And buried under those steps, according to the Copper Scroll, is over a thousand pounds of silver. Barfield found the steps. Then he found another location that describes a well and a courtyard. Under the courtyard is buried 33 tons of polished gold. He found the courtyard. He found the well. Jim Barfield brought his evidence to the local authorities and asked permission to dig at the site, but he was refused. Later, he went back with a metal detector tuned to look for gold and silver. When he got near the location, the metal detector went crazy. Again, he asked permission to dig. Again, he was refused. Barfield was certain that there was a third site containing even more treasure, including the Ark. Using the first two locations as waypoints, he drew a straight line to a cave in a nearby hill. The cave appeared to be sealed shut, but intentionally. Barfield then took a stone sample from the cave entrance and had it tested in a lab. The results were interesting. I decided that I would take a sample of this stone and send it off to a lab in Skokie, Illinois, where we had it examined. And they find that it is man-made mortar in a common mixture and formula from that time frame. Why would somebody seal a random hill with concrete? When he took the metal detector to the sealed cave, it registered five times the amount of metal that was detected at Qumran. Jim Barfield is firmly convinced that this is the location of the Ark of the Covenant. To this day, permission to dig has not been granted. But many Ark historians believe that if the Ark was in Qumran, that it's not there anymore. They believe the Ark was taken by a Catholic military order called the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, more commonly known as the Knights Templar. During the Crusades, a new Catholic military order emerged, the Knights Templar. From the very beginning, the Templars were known for their secrecy and their mystery. They were also shrewd when it came to finance and politics. They convinced both the Pope and the city leaders of Jerusalem that they would protect Christian pilgrims making the journey to the Holy City. But as soon as the Knights Templar established their headquarters on the Temple Mount, they started digging. And they weren't looking for treasure. The Knights were obsessed with religious relics and there was no greater prize than the Ark of the Covenant. The Templars were known for their use of caves and tunnels. And just recently, a structure was found in a cave system called Zedekiah's Cave. And this fortification was a guardhouse built to defend the Knights Templar if they had to escape the city. Legend says that they did indeed find the Ark and took it to their European headquarters in France, the famous Chartres Cathedral. And there it stayed for several hundred years. By the 14th century, the Knights Templar had lost most of their military power, but they had become wealthy from their banking practices. King Philip of France found himself deeply in debt to them, and in 1307, he convinced the Pope to move against the order and seize their assets. On October 13, 1307, the Knights Templar were declared outlaws, and any found were arrested, tortured, and often executed. But when the Templars heard rumors that King Philip and the Pope were moving against them, they relocated the Ark yet again this time to Scotland, where the Knights were welcomed by King Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce had been excommunicated by the church and was sympathetic to the Knights. So when the Knights Templar arrived in Scotland, they allied themselves with the wealthy and powerful Sinclair family. Together, they decided to build a place to keep the Ark of the Covenant safe, Roslyn Chapel. And there's a lot about Roslyn Chapel that connects to the Ark and the Holy Land. There are Templar motifs and sculptures all around the grounds. The chapel is laid out just like the first Temple of Solomon, but on a smaller scale. It has an inner Holy of Holies. This is where the Ark could have been kept, far away from the politics of Europe. But then, World War II. 
The Nazis were obsessed with the occult and religious relics. It's just like the movie! Well, Raiders got a lot of things right. I am the monarch of the sea, the ruler of the Queen's Navy. It's well documented that they searched for the Spear of Destiny, also known as the Holy Lance. This is the spear that is said to have pierced the side of Jesus as he hung on the cross during his crucifixion. They looked for the Holy Grail, the cup that Jesus used during the Last Supper. They sought the Shroud of Turin, the cloth used to wrap the body of Jesus after his crucifixion. The Germans wanted the menorah, the seven-branched candelabrum that was created during the Exodus. And of course, they sought the other object created during the time of Moses, the Ark of the Covenant. After they conquered France, the Germans engaged in major archaeological digs at Chartres Cathedral and other suspected locations of the Ark. After France was overrun, President Roosevelt of the United States arranged for the contents of Roslyn Chapel to be moved to the Americas where they could be better defended. So the Ark was sent from Scotland to New Scotland, also known as Nova Scotia, specifically to Oak Island. While this is just a legend, there is a complex system of caves and tunnels on Oak Island, and nobody knows exactly who put them there or what they were hiding. There are stories of the Ark ending up in Rome, where it sits on one of the 50 miles of shelves in the Vatican secret archives. Some say the Ark is buried on Mount Nebo in Jordan, where Moses died. An Irish legend says the Ark was brought to Ireland by the prophet Jeremiah and is now located in a secret chamber beneath the Hill of Tara. Or Jeremiah took the Ark to Egypt, and it's now located in a hidden chamber beneath the Sphinx. But there's evidence that the Ark isn't hidden away in a cave, or a tomb, or a secret chamber. It's not hidden at all. For hundreds of years, the Ark has been in a church, in what might sound like an unlikely place for a Jewish artifact. The Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia. In the Bible, in the books of 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, is the story of the Queen of Sheba. She was a wealthy and powerful queen who ruled over the Aksumite kingdom, located in what is now Ethiopia and Yemen. The Queen of Sheba heard of the great wisdom of King Solomon of Israel, and she traveled to Jerusalem to meet him. After witnessing the splendor of his kingdom, the Queen of Sheba returned home. That concludes the biblical account of the Queen of Sheba. But there's more to the story. The Kebra de Gast is an Ethiopian text that's at least 700 years old, and is considered by many Ethiopian Christians to be historically reliable. The text contains an account of how the Queen of Sheba not only met King Solomon, but had a son by him, named Menelik. At the age of 22, in about 950 BC, Menelik went to Jerusalem to meet his father. While there, Menelik's companions stole the Ark and replaced it with a replica. Solomon and Menelik both discovered the switch, but only after Menelik was flying back home, so there was nothing anyone could do about it. I couldn't reach him because they put the Ark in airplane mode, huh? No, the Ark with the power of God flew them home. Ah. The Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Axum claims to possess the actual Ark of the Covenant. The Ark is never seen by outsiders. When the Holy of Holies was built around the Ark, the hallways were made too small intentionally, so the only way to remove the Ark is to destroy the Church. Only one priest at a time serves as the guardian of the Ark, and only that priest is permitted to see it. The priest lives in the Church for the rest of his life. Now, to be the custodian of the Ark is a great honor, but it's also a death sentence. Priests who guard the Ark have a very short lifespan. Once appointed a guardian, they typically live no more than two or three years. But before they die, they develop cataracts and go blind. What would happen if someone did accidentally see the Ark? Blind. Would be blinded? And, yeah, a lot of miracles. Also bad blind. miracles. Yeah, like would yeah. be... Very high power. Uh, you know, maybe being alone in a room for two years, uh, they were doing something else that makes them go blind. Don't, don't be disrespectful. <laughs> What's interesting is, these symptoms are consistent with exposure to high levels of radiation. But if the Ark is in Ethiopia, it may no longer be in the church. In November 2020, war broke out between the Ethiopian government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front. The TPLF were rebels in Ethiopia, then rulers, then rebels again. The Tigray conflict saw atrocities committed on civilians perpetrated by both sides. When rebels approached the church in Aksum, at least 800 unarmed civilians rushed to protect it. They were slaughtered. An uneasy peace has been in place since November 2022, but it's difficult to get news out of the region. The priests in Aksum say the Ark is still safe within the walls of the church, but many locals say the Ark was stolen when the entire area was looted during the conflict. The priests won't allow anyone access to verify if the Ark is or isn't there. If the Ark of the Covenant is gone, 
then Ethiopia becomes another in a long list of places that had and lost the Ark. And even though the Ark of the Covenant is a religious artifact, Ark hunters aren't necessarily religious. The search for the Ark is of interest to people from all over the world, and perhaps even beyond it. The location of the Ark of the Covenant is a mystery that has endured for over 2,000 years, and that's plenty of time for the introduction of confusion and contradiction. Even the Bible has the Ark behaving differently at different times. It acted like a high-voltage capacitor that electrocuted Uzzah when he touched it. It was more like a heat ray that boiled away water when the Hebrews crossed the River Jordan. Then it was a powerful sonic weapon when it brought down the walls of Jericho. When it was Come tumbling down when the walls. Come crumbling, crumbling when the walls. Come tumbling down, tumbling down. Now maybe it's all those things, depending on what's needed in the moment. But then the question becomes, what was the power source? If people near the Ark really did break out into tumors and boils and cataracts and hemorrhoids, emeralds. What I say? If that's true, it sounds like the Ark housed an intensely radioactive device, a device that could be tuned to specific functions, including use as a weapon. But if that's true, where did Moses get it? And how did this technology exist thousands of years ago? It's been suggested that maybe the tablets containing the Ten Commandments were made of uranium, which exists in vast quantities in the deserts of the Middle East. But even if they were, raw uranium ore isn't dangerous. Only when it's refined is the radiation harmful. And I don't think it's controversial to say that the Israelites didn't have centrifuges and uranium enrichment technologies. Now, about the cataracts developed by the priests in Ethiopia. Cataracts can be developed one or two years after high radiation exposure, that's true. But it's also true that people who live at high altitudes are at greater risk of cataracts. The thinner atmosphere offers less protection from the sun's harmful rays, which damage the eyes. The city of Aksum, where the Ark is supposedly housed, is almost 7,000 feet above sea level, making it one of the highest altitude cities in the world. And there are other problems with the Ethiopian claim. Edward Uhlendorf was a professor of Ethiopian studies at the University of London. And he said in a 1992 interview that he personally saw the Ark held within the church at Axum. This was in 1941, while he was serving as an officer in the British Army. He said they have a wooden box. It wasn't ancient, and it certainly wasn't the original Ark. Every Christian church in Ethiopia has a replica of the Ark of the Covenant, as do many churches around the world. Professor Uhlendorf assumed that the Ark at Axum is nothing more than one of these replicas. But the professor didn't provide any proof that he actually saw the Ark. So, like many stories about the Ark of the Covenant, we have nothing to go on but the word of the person telling the story. The story of the Knights Templar hiding the Ark at Roslyn Chapel in Scotland is one of my favorites. But the chapel wasn't built until 1446, almost 150 years after the Templars were disbanded. Now, defenders of the Roslyn story will say that the Ark was kept somewhere else until the chapel was built. Then it was placed there. Now, that's fine, it's still a great story, but there's no proof of any of that. Locations like Oak Island, the Vatican, Ireland, and other alleged hiding places of the Ark are just stories. Now, I'm not saying that they're wrong, but there's no hard evidence to support any of those locations. The mainstream view is that the Ark probably existed. Remember we talked about the menorah, which was created at the same time as the Ark? Well, in 70 AD, Emperor Titus of Rome marched on Jerusalem, and after a five-month siege, the Roman soldiers breached the walls and poured into the city. The soldiers looted and burned everything in sight, including the Second Temple. Titus was hailed as a conquering hero, and a monument was built in his honor, the Arch of Titus, which still stands, depicting the spoils of war carried off from the temple in Jerusalem. Among the spoils is the menorah. Now, some have claimed that the other object being carried by the soldiers is the Ark, but it's not. That's the Table of Showbread, also known as the Table of the Presence. And this was a large table made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. And on the table were placed 12 loaves of bread that were replaced every Sabbath. What's interesting about the table is God gave Moses instructions to build it at the same time he gave instructions to build the menorah and the Ark of the Covenant. And all those objects were stored in the same place, the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem. If the Ark was looted, it would have been depicted on the arch. The Romans knew how important the Ark was to the Hebrews. They would have wanted to steal it to humiliate the Jewish people. So why wasn't the Ark there when Titus invaded? 
Most scholars believe it was taken by the Babylonians in 587 BC, but there's no proof of this. The Babylonians kept lists of everything stolen from Jerusalem, and the Ark wasn't on any of the lists. So if the Ark of the Covenant still exists, the most logical place for it to be is in a cave or a tunnel hidden somewhere deep under the Temple Mount. But permission to dig will likely never be granted. The site is considered sacred by Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and any damage to the site would be seen as an affront to these religions, or worse, a provocation. But maybe that's for the best. Zechariah was a prophet who lived during the time of the Second Temple in Jerusalem, and many of his prophecies are related to the return of the Ark of the Covenant. And the return of the Ark is also mentioned in Revelation. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of his Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. The return of the Ark happens at the end of the world. Now that might sound dramatic, but think about what would happen if the Ark was discovered by Muslims, or if it was discovered by Jews, or by Christians. What people would be the best stewards of the Ark? Everyone would want it, but whose decision is that to make? The discovery of the Ark could be the spark that ignites war in the region, which could possibly escalate to World War III. And the next thing you know, the end time prophecies are coming true. Now I'm fascinated by the Ark, and I'd love to know where it is. But for now, the location of the Ark of the Covenant remains a mystery. And for all our sakes, let's hope it stays that way. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. My name is AJ. You know Hecklefish. It's Hello. This has been The Y-Files. If you had fun or learned anything, do Hecklefish a favor, subscribe, like, comment, share. That stuff is really important. Like every topic we cover on the channel, today's was recommended by you. So if there's a story you'd like to see or learn more about, go to thewifiles.com slash tips. And special thanks to our patrons who make all this possible. You guys are amazing, and I'll see you on Discord in the morning. And if you'd like to be part of a great community, consider joining our Discord. It's free. But if you'd like to support the channel, consider becoming a member on Patreon for as little as three bucks a month. Or grab something from the Wildfile store. Uh, look, I'm not trying to plot, uh, but I'm quelling over the new t-shirt. Right? So be a mensch, get rid of your schmata, and pick up one for a few shekels. Or we'll grab a shot to you too. You'd be my sugar than that too. That it? That's my spiel, bubble. Muzzle top. That's gonna do it. Until next time, be safe, be kind, and know that you are appreciated. One more time. Do 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 do